Right. I think the time has come. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm delighted to see such a great turnout. You're never quite sure when you put on this sort of talk who's going to come, but this is an event which the London School is putting on on behalf of the London Climate Action Week. We're delighted to take part in this week, which is a great initiative and hopefully will lead to more in, f in the future. Uh, my name is Alan Dangor. I am a professor here at the School in Food and Nutrition for Global Health, and I'm the director of the school, the London School of Hygiene Centre on Climate Change and Planetary Health. Uh, I'd love to welcome you to the school. And for those of you that don't know, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is renowned for its research, postgraduate studies and continuing education in public health. The school has an international presence. We have 3,000 staff conducting research in over 100 countries and we have more than 4,000 students. Our mission is to improve health and equity in the UK and worldwide, working in partnership to achieve excellence in public health and global health research, education and translation of knowledge into policy and practice. So I'm delighted to welcome you to the school and I'm grateful again uh, that you've taken time out of your busy days to come and hear this talk. I'm going to uh, now introduce uh, my colleague Violet, who's going to say a few introductory remarks. Hi, so I'm Violet and I've just done my GCSEs at Emmanuel School in Clapham and I'm doing work experience with Alan because I think it's really important that people learn about our diets and the impact they have on the environment and like how that could change in the future and stuff like that. Because I think for young people now, climate change is a really big issue, like a lot greater than it was in the past. Because for me, it's a really weird thought that in the past, like older generations, wouldn't have had climate change shown to them as such a big issue in the way that it is today. And I think that young people always campaign on what they're passionate about, but now like climate change is one of the things that people are focusing on. So people campaigned about the Vietnam War and for like desegregation in the 60s, all the way to the Hong Kong protests in 2014. But now I think there's a much bigger focus on climate change in a way that there wasn't before. So there are climate change school strikes and I went on one from my school and took a bunch of my friends with me. And I wasn't expecting that many people to be there. But when we got there, there was actually so many students that are really passionate about climate change and making a difference. And I think there are lots of student activists you might have heard of, such as Greta Thunberg, who's gone from skipping school every Friday because she thinks there's no point studying if climate change is going to be such a problem. And she's gone just from standing outside the Parliament building to speaking to the UN Secretary General. So I think it shows that young people can make a difference and anyone can make a difference if you let your opinions be heard. And that's also why I think it's so important that like research like this is made available to everyone because then you know how to act as well as knowing that you want to act. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Violet. I've just, you know, Violet's joined us this week, turned up two hours ago, and I said, you're going to be on stage in two hours. Give it a go. Uh, I'm really delighted to have a voice of youth here coming to talk, because I'm old and grey, and Violet is, is the future, and her generation are going to really make a difference. And I went to the second student strike, and I was thrilled. I'll show you a couple of photos later. Thrilled at the level of excitement and, and, and willingness to demand change. That, you could, that, is now, that, that that's now present. So I'm going to give a talk, I'm, uh, hopefully an accessible talk, about food. Uh, I lead a team of uh, researchers here. I work with a team I don't lead. I sort of lead, but uh, really they do all the work. Uh, uh, a team of researchers here at the school uh, working on food systems and the impact of food systems on the environment and the impact of the environment on food systems. And to me, food is central to all the discussions we're having. The production of food, the need for food, the sorts of food we're eating uh, is absolutely central. Uh, this is a school of public health, so a lot of what I'll be talking about is, of course, going to be health. So let's look at what I had for dinner last night, uh, uh, just as an example. Uh, so look what I had for dinner last night, I had a very nice bowl of b b uh, beans, uh, uh, I had a little bit of chicken, and I had some strawberries. So I just want to think about, that's what I had for dinner. I also had some potatoes and almost certainly had a piece of chocolate, which I'm not going to tell you about, uh, or at least one piece of chocolate, I should say. Uh, but uh, uh, so just that's, that's what I had for dinner last night. Now, it's a, I put that up because it'll be a recurring theme throughout this talk, that we have choices. We make choices about what we want to eat. 
Now, I don't know if any of you have seen this book or looked at this book, What the World Eats. I had the great pleasure to meet uh, Peter Mensel and Faith Dalusio uh, last week, and I was in India. Uh, they came and gave an absolutely fantastic talk about this book, and I may as well give a plug to their new book, which is about what I eat. Uh, these are fantastic books that where they go to huge. I hadn't realized the amount of research that goes into making these books. Um, but they go to and, and look at families or look at individuals and find out what people are eating around the world. So this is the photo in the book about what the average uh, British person eats in a week. Uh, so the average British person seems to survive on a diet of chocolate uh, and uh, packaged food, small amounts of fruit and vegetables, lots and lots of milk and cereal, and uh, uh, some dog food. Uh, but you can see, so this is, this is a classic English diet. Uh, this, is, well, they, this, is, this is an example of a British diet, let's put it like that. Um, you can see, so from a health perspective, I'm somewhat worried about the lack of fresh, and fresh, fresh produce. I'm somewhat worried about the amount of chocolate, uh, and the dog looks nice and healthy, actually. Uh, and this is an American diet. This is a, this is a family in North Carolina, um, and you can see the pre pre predominance of processed and packaged foods in these diets, uh, in this diet. Um, uh, massive amounts of uh, brightly coloured packaging uh, driving food choice. So, um, uh, so. Uh, this is what we're all supposed to be eating, and this is the UK Public Health England guidance on what we're supposed to be eating to eat well. It's called the Eat Well Guide. You can see that a really good 40 percentage uh, of the diet is made up of fruits and vegetables. Uh, roughly the same proportion is made up of carbohydrates, uh, lots of complex carbohydrates. Quite a small amount of the diet is made up of uh, animal source foods or, or protein alternatives like beans and lentils, small amounts of dairy, uh, almost no oil, and chocolate and crisps and all of those things that we seem to eat constantly are called, uh, it says, eat less often and in small amounts. You'll see at the very top, it says, use the Eat Well Guide to help you get a balance of healthier and more sustainable food. So there is some, there was, this was written, I think, uh, 2016. So three years ago, there's some reference to sustainability within these guidelines, but, uh, but it's largely, uh, uh, it's, there's, not a, there's not a great deal of emphasis. Now, who in this room follows their Eat Well Guide? So that's uh, roughly 40% cereals, roughly 40% fruit and vegetables, 20% meat, fish, beans, and dairy, and tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of oil, chocolate, cakes, and crisps. Put your hand up if you think that represents your diet. Mm, I've got a few nutrition students in the room <laughs> who, who all pass with flying colors, or so they say anyway. Uh, uh, so, so do you eat it? And the answer, what, what, what percentage of the UK population? So we have the data on the UK diet, UK dietary intakes. What percentage do you think of the UK population eats the Eat Well diet? 5%, 6%, 10%? Any? How many? Two. 2%? So actually, 2 is an interesting number, because we now have data on more than 6,500 people, the dietary intake of 6,500 people from the National uh, Diet and Nutrition Survey, the NDNS. And if you look at those 6,500 people, 2 is exactly the number of people who eat the Eat Well Guide. So 0% uh, so is the actual percentage of people who follow the Eat Well, the Eat well Guide. And that's a worrying, worrying problem, of course, if we, if we care about health. Now, what are the consequences? The major consequences in a setting, in a Western setting like the UK, a major consequence of not following Eat Well Diet are, is the enormous amount of overweight obesity and then these diseases called uh, uh, nutrition-related chronic diseases that result. So of the 5 billion people on the planet, uh, approximately 2 billion, so 2 out of 5, are either overweight or obese. And roughly 1 in 12 has type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes comes typically from being overweight and sedentary and a very monotonous diet that's rich in carbohydrates. So from a global health perspective, there's clearly something wrong with what we're eating. Were we to eat, as we'll see later, were we to eat the, uh, a, more, a more healthy diet, there would of course be benefits for health, uh, which, which are important. So why do we eat what we eat? Why did I have what I la at last night? Why do those pictures that I showed you just now of those families, why are those people eating what they eat? So what do you think are the main drivers of dietary choices? Yeah. When we walk down the supermarket aisle, what we see. What we see, okay. So what is advertised, what is presented to us in the supermarkets? What else? What are the other major drivers? Price. Price, really important. Time. Time. Convenience. Convenience. 
Advertising, all right. So lots of things. Okay, there's lots of drivers of dietary choice. Taste is a good one. Uh, so here we go. This is a mother feeding her child. So she's caring about giving her giving her child a healthy diet that she she considers to be healthy and good for the, the growth of that child. Uh, convenience. So this is a bunch of students, of course, not to pick on students. We all do this. Pick up something on the way home. Look for some easy way um, of, of, of feeding ourselves uh, with the food that we want to eat. Uh, we might be institutionalized, so older people living in, in a home, uh, in, a, in, a, in a care home, or other institutions, you know, schools, prisons, you know, there's loads of institutions, or workplaces, what's available in those workplaces. Um, and of course, culture, tradition, all of that stuff that's so important uh, as major drivers um, of, of, of what we eat. And I think, you know, therefore it becomes quite complicated, how do you shift patterns, how do you get people to change what they're eating? So within all of that, I didn't hear anyone shout out, I choose food because I care about the environment. But do we think, do we think, what do you think people care about the environment? So there was a survey in 2017 which asked questions about what are our shopping habits? What are the UK shopping habits? They asked 2,000 people, a telephone survey, and these were the five things that you could answer. Taste, cost, health, ethics, largely to do with animal foods, uh, animal source foods, and the environment. So you are allowed one vote each. You have to choose one of those five. Taste, cost, health, ethics, and environment. So when you're making choices, which of those five is the most important? So put your hands up if it's taste. Okay, you'll add one vote each, okay? Okay, that's good. Put your hands up if it's cost. Okay, put your hands up if it's health. Oh, you're all showing off. Look at that. Lots of, <laughs> lots of health people. All right, what about ethics? You care about the way animals are a couple of people saying ethics. And what about the environment? Choices for the environment? Yeah, very small. Okay, but clearly there, but small. So the answers from the survey was that 95% of people choose food based on what they like to eat. So the taste of that food, that's pretty, you know, that you wouldn't buy something you don't like the taste of. Uh, cost, 90% of people. Cost is very important, obviously hugely important. Um, what about health? Somewhere in the region is 70%. So these are, let's remember, these are people who picked up the phone and answered the questions. So it's not exactly a, a, a fully random sample. Ethics, less than 50% of people care about ethics. And the environment, less than about, it's around about 30%. So 30% of people are saying, I really care about the environment. And I think it's really important when I'm making my food choices. So let's just talk about the link between the environment and our diets. What is the link? Well, when we think about foods and diets in a school of public health, traditionally, we've thought about the links between foods and diets and the health of populations. So what food, uh, what food are we eating and what impact is that going to have on the health of populations? Now, you need to remember that food, food comes from a food system. And that food system, I'll show you in a moment, is very big, all the way from the farm, all the way to the fork. The food system itself has an enormous, and we're learning more and more about the scale of the impact of the food system on the environment, and simultaneously, of course, the environment and the way the environment changes has an impact both on the food system and on our health. So you can see that there is a very, very close link between what we're choosing to eat, our health, and the environment. And this is the, this is the work that we do in our group here at the school, looking at the interconnection between these three important domains, health, the food system, and our environment. So how does the food system affect the environment? Let's just talk about, first of all, what is the food system? So the food system is the production of food, goes all the way from the production of food on the farm through to the processing plant where those foods are, 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 are either cleaned and packaged or processed into different types of food, uh, to the warehouse, to the shop, to your home where you do your cooking, to the food that you eat, and to the bin. And the policies, the financial institutions, the, all of the various things that shape all of those things. So that's the food system. Now if you think at every single one of those steps, there's an environmental impact. So, for example, on the farm, we might use herbicides and pesticides. We might put different fertilizers on. And, of course, farms are major sources that require, require large amounts of fossil fuels for tractors and other things. In the processing plant, of course, more fossil fuels. And then, of course, in comes the big waves, swathes of plastic and glass and metal and tin. And then, in the, again, in the, in the warehouse and in the shops, more fossil fuels, more packaging. At home, more fossil fuels to cook your food. 
And then, of course, if you think about the recycling and the waste, more fossil fuels for all of that, and then, re and then recycling all your, all your plastics. So you can see that the food system itself has a major impact on the environment in many, many different ways. I've just given a few examples here. And in fact, it's estimated that almost 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions, so of all of the greenhouse gas emissions on the planet, somewhere between 25 and 30% arise from the food system. So the food system is a major contributor to, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. So what are those impacts on the environment? So there are sort of three or four major impacts that we talk about. The first one is, of course, as I've just mentioned, greenhouse gases. And so just on the farm alone, uh, there are enormous sources, many very variety of different sources of greenhouse gases, whether it's methane, uh, whether it's carbon dioxide, uh, whether it's different nitrogen uh, uh, radicals and, and, and compounds that go into the air that cause uh, climate change as a result uh, of increasing their concentration in the atmosphere. Uh, water. Agriculture is, of course, a major user of water. So something in the region of 60% of all water on the planet is used for, for agriculture. And in some parts of the world, I was in India last week, somewhere in the region of 90% of water that's drawn from, from rivers or from underground aquifers is used for agricultural production. Soil degradation last year, or I think is it this year or last year, was the International Year of the Soil. There's a huge concern about what the quality of soil and what repeated amounts of uh, industrial farming is doing to the soil. And finally, of course, land use change and habitat loss. And for those of you that care about biodiversity and butterflies and all of those things, you know, we know that turning, farm, turning uh, um, uh, uh, forests and other types of land, wild land, into intensively grown agricultural land uh, has a tremendous impact on biodiversity. And we're losing a species at an, at an unprecedented rate. So you can see that, the environment, that, that farming and the food system has a major impact on the environment in various different ways. And we can calculate some of that impact as well. We can calculate the impact, uh, for example, here, these are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with different foods, the production of different foods. So, for example, beef and lamb have, this is in kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of food. So the, the unit of greenhouse gas emissions is ki of kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. And you can see, I mean, all you really need to see here is that some foods have a massive uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission associated with their production compared to others. So it's the animal source foods, beef, lamb, cheese and butter that have these very large footprints, whereas other, other, other um, foods uh, have, uh, like fruits and vegetables have much lower environmental footprints in, with regards to greenhouse gas emissions. So you, you can see again you can make a choice. You can decide if you care about the environment, you can decide which foods you're going to choose to eat. I'm very fortunate to have chosen some foods with relatively low greenhouse gas emissions. So my piece of chicken, a little bit of uh, some vegetables and some fruit uh, um, are amongst the lower greenhouse gas emitting foods. But you can make choices and you know, but this sort of information is useful and necessary uh, for those choices. We can also estimate the amount of water that's being used uh, that is required in the production of foods. And so these are called water footprints. Some foods, again beef, require, um, has a massive water footprint. So per kilogram of beef, one kilogram of beef requires 15,000 litres of water in its production. Whereas things like fruits and vegetables, again, have much lower water footprints, but it's actually quite surprising how large some of those are. And of course, nuts are a, ma are a major user of, of, uh, of water in their production as well. So again, you need to make some choices. And uh, again, my choices were, 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 weren't the best, uh, but uh, were lower than others. So, so we can estimate these impacts and we can make some choices about what we're going to eat. And we can also, here in the UK, we've done some modelling. Uh, oh, so, so if we look at the UK diet, we can also decide which bits of our diets required, require change. So this is the, these are the recommendations from the World Health Organization on what we should all be eating. And we should all be eating somewhere between 50 and 30% of our diet as fat, somewhere between 55 and 75% of our diet as carbohydrates, 10% uh, as sugar, less than 10% of sugar, uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent is protein and we should all eat 400 grams of fruit and vegetable a day. On the right I'm going to put up the data for UK males and UK females and I've put in uh, in black uh, the the areas where we meet the recommendations. 
<laughs> so the UK diet is pretty shocking, as I've already discussed, and you can see that we eat far too much fat, not enough carbohydrates, and certainly not enough complex carbohydrates with all that fibre in it, uh, too much sugar, uh, too much protein, and we don't go anywhere near uh, the recommendations for fruit and vegetable consumption. So our diets require quite a lot of work uh, to get them better. And what we did with Rosie Green uh, here in the front, in the front uh, from our team is we estimated what, you, what would happen, what, what changes would need to happen to the diets to make them A, healthier, or B, a very low emissions with very low, uh, very low greenhouse gas emission diet. So, for example, if you look, we have three columns in each, under, for each of these different food groups, and we've got red meat, white meat, dairy, uh, sugary foods, and soft drinks. And you can see the first dark green column is the current diet, the, the lighter green column is a healthy diet, which meets the WHO recommendations, the World Health Organization recommendations. And then the very light green uh, is if, if we looked for a diet which had 60% lower greenhouse gas emissions. So what you can see immediately for all of these foods, red meat, white meat, dairy, sweets and, and soft drinks, you'd need to reduce the amount of those in your diets if you, if you wanted to be healthy or if you wanted to go towards a lower greenhouse gas emission diet. But the converse is the case for cereals, vegetables, beans and pulses, fruit and nuts and seeds. So an increase in the amount of cereals, vegetables, beans, fruit would lead to a healthier diet, of course, and also those diets would have a lower greenhouse gas emissions. So we know what to do. We know that these changes would not only be enormously, we've done the, we've done the, uh, uh, the work, we've uh, estimated the size of this, this impact, and if we followed these, uh, these recommendations, we'd save you know, 8 million life years, or sort of this. Uh, uh, so large benefits to health in the UK, uh, and we'd also reduce, if we just changed to a healthier diet, we'd reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the UK by about nearly 20%. So these would be very important changes uh, that are well within our reach. The Lancet recently, I don't know if the Lancet is one of the world's most important uh, biomedical journals, uh, and it recently uh, produced this report, which received quite a lot of press, I'd say about two, two and a half months ago. And it was the Eat Lancet Commission on Healthy Diets from a Sustainable Food System. And they did an enormous piece of modeling where they said, what would a diet need to look like if it was good for our health and environmentally sustainable. And very helpfully, one of the newspapers pulled up this, made this figure for us, uh, which shows the diet on a plate, as it were. And you can see that the diet, that th this, this uh, uh, recommendation was half the plate should be fruits and vegetables. About a, th a further third of the plate should be carbohydrates, which would be largely whole grain carbohydrates, so with all that fiber. Small amounts of dairy, small amounts of meat, very small amounts of meat, I should say. Uh, some alternative plant-based protein sources, uh, 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 some oils, uh, vegetable oils, um, and tiny amounts of sugar. So as an average, you know, this was the recommendation, this was called the planetary health diet, a recommendation that we should all be moving towards these diets. And of course there is a move here in the UK, for example, a move towards a diet that has more fruits and vegetables. We're seeing more vegetarians every day, more vegans every day. There's a large movement. Uh, there's still, of course, a large pushback and people say, I like my traditional diet. I want to make the choices I want to make. And internationally, of course, there are very big questions uh, about whether this diet would work in Ethiopia or this diet would work in uh, some uh, Southeast Asian countries. You know, you know, you need to fit in one of those in important drivers of diet, which is culture and tradition. Uh, so there's, there was, it, it received a mixed response, let's put it like that. There's some, there's some fantastic work that's gone into this, but understanding this at a country level uh, and for individual populations, is, there's still a bit of work to do. So what are the changes that, we, we, that are obviously important if we, want to con, you know, if we want to change our dietary habits in a way that's good for the planet and good for our health? I think number one is obviously we need to think about the environment much more when we're making choices. So it should really be at the top of that list, above taste and above cost. What is the impact on the environment? But then, of course, all those other things that you all know, if in order just to meet the government's recommendations, uh, so this, this, a diet which has less meat, more fruit, more sustainably for sourced fish, less food waste, uh, is one, and, in, and a diet in which we all eat a little bit less, uh, is one that meets the Eat Well Guide and would be good for our health and probably the planet as well. What about the other way? How will a changing environment affect food production? 
So what's the evidence that as the environment changes, as climate changes, there'll be an impact on the food that's, that's produced and, uh, and consumed? So first of all, a note on climate change. It's pretty clear. So we have a graph here which shows from the year 2000 to year 2100. We have two lines. The blue line, uh, I'll start with the red line. The red line is the we're going to do nothing about climate change line where we're not going to take any action to reduce climate change or to mitigate or to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that will lead to a global average increase in temperature of around four degrees. And I'll come back to what a global average means, uh, but a global average increase in temperature of about four degrees. The blue line is the line which says we're going to do absolutely everything in our power to stop emitting greenhouse gases and to mitigate the effects of, green, uh, uh, of climate change as much as possible. And that will still lead to a roughly uh, one and a half to two degrees uh, impact uh, change in, in temperature, global average. Now, of course, we don't live in a globally average place. Uh, and oceans are, are much slower to warm up than land. And in fact, the estimates uh, from Peter Cox at the University of Exeter are that by 2050, uh, we're looking at a, a three degrees warmer UK. OK, so that whatever we do, pretty much, it'll still be three degrees warmer in the UK. So these are, uh, but of course, some countries are going to face a much greater impact. So uh, I didn't, I said we don't, we don't, there's not some average place. Everyone lives in a different part of the world, of course, and the impacts in different parts of the world are going to be quite distinct. So you can see here that some parts of the world are going to be unbelievably hot. Uh, the, the North Pole, for example, if you look at the, the RCP 8.5, this graph here on the right, uh, is the one which tells us that uh, that's, that's we're going to do nothing about climate change. It's going to be 10 degrees warmer in the North Pole. So 10 degrees warmer in the North Pole means no ice. Okay, so this is a whole different world. Uh, the other graph, which is the graph RCP 2.6, which is we're going to do everything we possibly can, it's still going to be three or four degrees warmer, um, but maybe that won't be as bad as it could be, obviously. And of course, so you can see in different parts of the world, the impacts are going to be uh, tremendously different. And also in the bottom half there, you can see the impacts on rainfall are going to be different as well. Different parts of the world are going to suffer in different ways, more rain or less rain. Now, what does that do to global crop production? So the estimates, this is from a World Bank report, the estimates are that global cereal yields, certainly in the hot parts of the world, Africa, South and Southeast Asia, are going to decline dramatically. 10, 15 percent lower yields or more in parts of the world, in those parts of the world. Uh, and conversely, Northern Europe, North America, there's going to be increases in crop production, yields of, of these crops, because it's going to be a much nicer place to live in. It's going to be a bit warmer. It's going to be, uh, there's going to be you know, more rain, potentially. Uh, it's going to be better for crop production. So yields of the important cereals that we eat, the rice, the, the uh, wheat, uh, maize, corn, uh, all of those things are going to grow uh, much better in the north. And so there'll be increases in yield. But what we can see is that those parts of the world where the vast majority of the population will live, Africa, South and Southeast Asia, are going to have reductions in their yield. And this is going to be quite a dramatic, uh, going to lead to potentially some quite dramatic consequences. And we also have data here from our group, which we're, we're publishing uh, on, on not just the cereals, but also on vegetables, on legumes, on fruit and nuts and seeds. And so the evidence, we, and those things are important for us for health. Remember, we just talked about the importance of those things in a healthy and balanced diet. And the evidence on the production of those uh, also suggests that there will be declines in yields under increased temperature and reduced rainfall and increased ozone uh, 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 and other things. The marine catches are also likely to change. This is, a, I always find this graph quite, this map quite difficult to look at. The gray area is the land mass. The blue and orange and red area is, of course, the sea. And you can see where it's orange and red, there's projected to be significant declines in marine catch. So the amount of fish that's available. So there'll be, you know, under a changing world, there'll be lots and lots of change to the food that is available for us to eat. Now, is it really that important? Because if we've got the grains in the north and we can just shift them around and it'll all be fine. Well, uh, let's just have a look at a recent example. In 2009, 2010, 2011, there was a spike, an unexpected spike in the price of food. Not really clear why. Lots of different theories. There was certainly an El Nino event which led to several poor, poor harvests, um, but other things were going on at the same time. But that price in the spike of food was sudden, it was dramatic, and it was quite large. 
The consequence, the estimates are that this pushed the number of people on the planet who were undernourished to over a billion. So after a, you know, a couple of decades of in a decline in the number of people who were undernourished, suddenly the food price spike led to an increase in the number of people to over one billion people. And this then takes me to Global Health Lecture Part 2, What is the State of Global Health? And this is in the previous one, Part 1, I was talking about overweight and obesity and the diseases there. And in Part 2 here now you can see that out of a population of 7 billion, uh, 2 billion people have vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And a nearly a billion have, uh, aren't eating enough dietary energy, enough calories every day. So we'd see these are very, very large numbers of people. So there is a clear risk that declining yields, shifting in the availability of food globally, will lead to significant negative impacts on, on global health. But they also lead to this sort of thing. So from the same, the, that's the same spike, and there were riots in food riots, food-related riots in 22 countries around the world. So civil disorder. And migration is, of course, the next big question. How many people will be forced to move or choose to move as a result of the changing price, availability, access, affordability of foods in their countries? Uh, in the UK, we've got a quite an interesting story that I thought I'd tell you about. Um, in 1987, this list of... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight... There we go. This list of eight vegetables uh, provided about 90% of all the vegetables we ate in the UK. Over time, that list has increased. We're eating a much more diverse list of vegetables. So by 2016, that nut had gone up to 10 or uh, had gone up to 13 or 14 different uh, vegetables that provide the 90% of the vegetables we eat in the UK. So that's great from a diversity perspective also tells us that we're making interesting choices about what we want to eat, also tells us that we have a food system now which is able to deliver a greater diversity of foods for us. Um, in the 1980s, 80% 80 of those vegetables were grown in the UK. So we were very self-sufficient, we could look after ourselves. We imported from Spain, from France, we imported tomatoes from Saudi Arabia, if you're wondering what they are. Why, that's the blue. Uh, but most of the food, so the blue countries there, are the ones we import food from. But 80% of our vegetables were grown in the UK. Now, the situation now is that roughly 40% of the foods, in the, the vegetables that we eat in the UK are grown in the UK. So a dramatic decline. Yeah? But you'll also notice that we're importing foods from a much greater diversity of countries. And you can see from the hatched lines that several of those countries are climate vulnerable. So we're importing foods from countries that, in the very near future, are extremely unlikely to be able to produce those foods for us anymore. So we're doing two things. Number one, we're using somebody else's natural resources, which are very scarce in that country, to feed ourselves. Thank you very much. And number two, we are at risk of not having the foods that we want to eat in this country because we're importing them from countries that are climate vulnerable. So what's the question for us? The question is, is this appropriate? Should we be using other people's resources? How do we look after the, the health of our nation? How do we think about the farming situation in the UK, uh, where only 40% of all vegetables consumed are produced here? Then I think there are big policy questions there. So what about solutions? I, I'm not a doom and gloom person. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a data-driven person. So I'm about finding out the evidence and then identifying solutions. So there are a whole series of solutions that are agricultural and behavioral. So agricultural solutions, you know, rather than, you know, I'm sure you've all seen these enormous sprayers all over the countryside spraying crops. Well, rather than do that, you can have drip irrigation, which drips water in at a very sensible rate to grow plants. We have increasing amounts of vertical agriculture. So that middle top gra graph uh, figure is, 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 is plants being grown indoors in warehouses. Reduced environmental footprint in some ways, reduced water, reduced pesticides, reduced herbicides. It's often done in, the U in cities, so therefore you can have reduced uh, 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 transport costs as well. <coughs> we can have here on, uh, we have a, a, a rice varieties that are selected 
either naturally or, or through genetic modification, are selected to have different uh, traits which allow them to grow in different conditions. Uh, this is a, a type of rice that can grow, a naturally selected type of rice that can grow submerged underwater for long periods of time. But there are also varieties now that are being grown which are drought tolerant. There's maize that's drought tolerant and other varieties that are being developed in order that the food system can be resilient and can respond to future environmental change. And the foods we're eating, whether they be uh, that boy is eating uh, orange orange flesh sweet potato, which has more vitamin A in it, it's a, a variety of, of uh, sweet potato. We might start eating much many more insects, I'd started already, but insects might become a very regular part of our diet in the future. Or we could move to the far extreme, that burger on the right is a burger that has been produced in a laboratory, it costs a quarter of a million pounds, it is lab-grown meat, uh, but that is also a potential future that lots of people are looking at. So those are the agricultural behavioural and behavioural solutions, but we also need climate policies, trade policies and equity policies that are national but also international to allow us to, to feed people healthily uh, uh, in a sustainable way. But that requires policy makers who recognise <laughs> climate change and care about their populations. Uh, this is a graph, that's, this is a figure that's produced by Kate uh, Roworth, who wrote that wonderful book, Donut Economics, where she's saying that um, uh, there is a safe space for humanity. Uh, and, 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 and it's identifying that safe space for humanity. So in the middle of that image there, uh, you have uh, human deprivation. So no health, no food, no water, no income. As populations uh, develop, they move through this safe space for humanity, a, a place where it's safe for us to live. We have everything we need. We have education, uh, we have jobs, we have energy, we have social equity and all of those things. Uh, but we haven't damaged our planet. If we move too far, we have climate change, we have freshwater use, we have nitrogen pollution, we have all of those other bad things which are destroying the planet. And Kate Roworth makes a compelling case that there is this, this, this safe space for humanity and we are in the business of, of navigating and identifying that safe space, moving us back from where we've already gone over those boundaries into the danger uh, and, and developing countries in a way and, and populations and helping them to develop in a way that doesn't, that takes them out of the human deprivation without exceeding uh, uh, those limits. This is a very uh, d a difficult thing to do, of course, uh, but that's th the research that we're doing here. And that takes me on to planetary health. Many of you might wonder what planetary health. We are firmly staying on this planet for now, uh, but planetary health is about the health of human civilization and the state of natural systems on which it depends. So recognizing that we're part of one planet, we have one, ch we have one chance to do this right. And at the moment, our drive for health and development is coming at a cost, and that cost is being borne by the planet. And that's not sustainable and not continue and we and we must find a way to 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 resolve that and of course that there's a huge appetite for this at the moment so violet went on the first climate student march i went on the second one and the government de you know the three days before uh, we went on the march the government declared a state of climate emergency it's not at all clear what that means the government has yet to decide what that means uh, but there's a real push that we should do much more uh, to, to, and as you heard from Violet, a passionate voice from students uh, and young people who want us to be doing more. The government recognises this and uh, the government's put out the 25-year environment plan as an example, 25-year environment plan as an example of something uh, of a way forward. The Welsh uh, um, uh, Parliament has put out the Future Generations Act and the few donors of you know about the Future Generations Act, so that every single act of the Welsh Assembly has to go through the, the Future Generations Act, has to be scrutinised to see what is the impact of that law, of that policy, on the future generations. So it's a very uh, insightful, forward-thinking piece of work. So we have things like the 25-year environment plan. There is a new bill, the new agriculture bill, which is currently going through Parliament, led by Michael Gove uh, from his department, Department of uh, Food... Uh, environment, food and rural affairs. Uh, and that contains much more information about what, you know, how the UK produces its food and, uh, a, a, and the impact of that on the environment. Uh, and there is also, you might have seen last week, there was an announcement from the government about a national food strategy. 
So this is potentially game-changing. Understand, so for the first time, or one of the first times since the Second World War, there will be a strategy for how the UK acquires its food and what sorts of food and how it's going to do that without damaging the environment. So really big changes potentially underway. And I think a lot of that is because of the momentum and the movement and the appetite for this sort of action. And I advise something called the, uh, the Environmental Audit Committee uh, in UK Parliament, which is a, which is a body which is, has a series of inquiries, uh, and, and the, the latest one was on, the planetary, on planetary health, and will be coming out with recommendations in the next month or so on what the UK government should be doing to ensure planetary health. And there's a big feature on food systems, of course, within that inquiry. And we also have the broader commitment. We've made a commitment as a country to, uh, and as an international community to these things called the Sustainable Development Goals. And health for us as a school of public health is at the center of that. So what are these Sustainable Development Goals to develop the world, all countries, not just poor countries as it was in the past, but all countries in a way that we can all benefit uh, from, from our planet and don't damage it. So what can we do, just to finish up, what can we do to really make a difference? Well, I think, number one, I hope from, from this talk, we, we all have a sense. I mean, you're all here for a reason because you care about food, but taking food for granted is for the dinosaurs, as it were. That we cannot ca take that, you know, we're very, very fortunate. I work in a lot of countries where you cannot go into the shop and buy whatever you want. And you, uh, so, you know, taking food for granted is, it, it, it can no longer happen. We need to, the information that we're generating, our group, but all these other groups around the world as well, about the environmental impact of our dietary choices uh, is in hugely important information, which hopefully we'll be able to present in an accessible way that will enable people to make choices, not just about taste and cost, but also uh, about, uh, uh, about the environment. I want us all to talk to each other much more. So in the pub, men talk about football, uh, but in the pub it would be really nice if we also talked about these sorts of issues. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, the more we talk about environment, the link between the food system and the environment and health, we talk to all sorts of different people, get this on the public agenda. I think we should all be advocates. We should all be the people who go out and talk about this and we should all lead by example, think about our choices, behave in a way that demonstrates leadership. And finally, I think we should demand change. I think we are too passive. I think there's nowhere near enough uh, public voice uh, uh, on these issues. Uh, we need to get moving. We cannot wait for disasters to strike before any action happens. And I think the more we demand change uh, at all different levels, in our children's schools, in the local council, in parliament, wherever we have a voice and wherever we can demand change, we should be demanding change. So I'll finish with that. And I will, uh, I'm delighted again. I'm really thrilled that you've all come this lunchtime and given up your time. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.